All right. Welcome back to Resilient Voices and Beyond. I believe this is episode 23 of season two. Um, yes, I believe it is episode 23. I'm not messing up this time, but <laughs> just in case I did, 23, 24. Um, but just welcome back, everybody. I'm excited for today's episode. First and foremost, I want to give my thanks and gratitude to all you guys who, who support me, uh, recommending people, recommending topics, you know, supporting the coffee and conversation, you know, and all the work that I do. But more, most importantly, you know, I want to uh, give a special thanks to all the people who have been on season one and season two. Truly could not do this without you guys. Um, you have been able to help this platform thrive and grow through sharing your own life experiences. So thank you for that. Uh, those who may be passing through and coming across this podcast and just don't know who I am, my name is Michael D. Davis Thomas. I am 25 years old. I spent a little bit over 11 years in the Michigan Child Welfare System. I um, started advocating at age 15. I have 10 years plus um, and working in child welfare, doing everything for working, advocating nationally and statewide, doing policy and programming, working in corrections on the juvenile and juvenile facilities to working in congregate care as a youth care worker, sitting on over 15 different boards. And I am currently continuing my education and pursuing um, obtaining a doctorate um, on a on this slow pacing slope because education is hard. But um, that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm glad that you're here, but more importantly, we're here to highlight the guests that I have on today. So if you guys don't mind, um, and if you don't mind introducing yourself. Uh, Michael, soon we'll be able to call you Dr. Michael though, right? Which is even <laughs> maybe more important. I'll be excited for that day, Michael. I'm going to encourage you on that. Uh, super honored and privileged to be here, Michael. I'm Shenandoah Shepelo. I am also a kiddo who aged out of the Michigan foster care system long before Michael aged out of the foster care system. Uh, there was me. I am much older than 25, but we don't have to, right, Michael? I don't have to disclose, right? I, I get to no, choose you're, my you're totally fine. I get to to choose my own disclosures. So I'm much older than Michael, but I aged out. Uh, I entered foster care uh, multiple times, entered in at 13, ultimately aged out into homelessness at 15, and then decided that I'd keep my story a secret for a really long time until the work I was doing led me to share my story. Um, I was working in, as an office administrator, a law office administrator. I had been doing that work for about 17 years, primarily working in criminal defense offices, and sort of began asking myself how we could reform criminal justice and, and was really a strong advocate in the criminal justice world when I came to realize that um, about 95% of our clients had been in child welfare. And sort of through the strength of my clients who really said, you need to share your story so there's not people like me, right? That's how my clients, they weren't in a position to share their story. So in 2016, five years after I started, I released my first book, Garbage Bag Suitcase, with the idea that we would change the way in which we saw, <clears throat> excuse me, child welfare. And that actually, that book actually led me um, to realizing that there was something even before child welfare, which was the trauma informed circle. And how do we actually heal whole families? How do we heal ourselves? And so I'm really fortunate now that for the last 10 or 15 years or so, I've been able to work in systems, building trauma informed frameworks in order to not only heal, but to prevent re-traumatization. Uh, that we all know happens so frequently, not just in child welfare, but in school systems, in medical systems, in government systems, um, in human services of all different kinds. And so I'm fortunate that I get to help organizations and systems build those to heal their staff, to heal the people that they're working with, and to prevent re-traumatization. So super excited that you asked me to be here today, Michael. Awesome, awesome. Um, I, I, you know, something really struck my struck my brain, and um, it's just it's really it's really funny how our clients, 
you know, get us in these, <laughs> get us in these in predicaments where, like, I guess I go out there and shit. Because, you know, I remember, you know, a time when um, I started out sharing my story at 15, but I remember a time when I took a seat back and I was like, you know, let me let me reexamine where my life is going, you know, and I was like, maybe it's not me sharing my story. Maybe it's not, you know, that was that helped me heal from so mm. much of my own trauma. And maybe that was what it was for. Um, so I took a remember taking a seat back in like my early adulthood. And it was crazy how I started finding my way to working with people and working with friends and things like that. And it's just like life was like, no. <laughs> you know your story is meant to be heard you know um and even if it's not specifically your story moments of your story are mm-hmm. meant to help other people you know and in that way um so I just thought it was really it's really crazy how that happens um yeah because I think like for me right so also different times at like how we each came up in the system and what was sort of going on in the world and, and how we viewed that for me there was so much pain attached to my story and, and so many myths attached to my story. Right. So Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of my years between 13 and 18 being asked, well, what'd you do wrong to be in foster care? Mm. Uh, If your parents can't love you, who can love you? Like, are you, are you worthy of love? Um, Things that, that were really attached to the myths of why kids were in care in the first place. I'm not sure that we're over all of those myths yet. I know you would agree oh, that, <laughs> that, that, that many of those myths still exist. Um, and like, that was a lot of pain that I wasn't ready to deal with, right? Like developmentally, I was just trying to survive. Like I was trying to figure out where my next meal was coming from. And so this idea of like, healing not only from my my birth parent trauma and then the trauma of the system right there's i sort of see my life in phases i have i have i have a family of origin trauma and then i have systemic trauma from from my foster care experience mm-hmm. and and then i have of course just living my own life that has caused trauma right my mm-hmm. my own decisions that i've made post 18 and and things often based on the things that have happened to me beforehand, that I thought um, no one needs to hear that. Mm-hmm. And and I really lived the idea of fake it till you make it. Just pretend. Mm. Just, just keep pretending and it will all work out. And what I came to really understand with my clients was, is first, I wasn't the only one because very much in my growing up, right? No social media. Like I didn't know other foster kids. I I wasn't connected to them. We didn't have advocacy points as you talk about that, you know, you got to start telling your story at 15. That wasn't something that that we got to do. And so mm-hmm. um I felt very isolated. And it wasn't until talking with my clients, and I I, I love your laughter about like our clients get us into these messes. It's like they mm-hmm. I, I often get just as much strength from them as I think they say they get from me, right? Like that is for me a two-way street. Being on a show like yours is like I get just as much strength from you and hearing you is that I hope your listeners will get from hearing us. You know, it to me. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it is a back and forth. And so when my client said, if you don't share your story, what about all the kids that we could save from being me? Like they need to know they're not alone. They need to know that there is another way through this. And that was the thing for me where it was like, wait, I'm actually being selfish by not doing this, yeah. that, that, that there is a different way through and it doesn't have to be so painful and we don't have to be alone and we can talk about this. And so for me, it was shining this light and much like, you know, the, the women's movement, the me too movement, all of a sudden, when I started shining the light, there were people raising their hands saying, well, me too. Well, I was in foster, like, wait, we can talk about this. And, (laughs) and, and there's a space and I'm not alone. And there are people who are struggling in real life, who are faking it, who are trying to just get by. And I think there's some real strength in that of, of what I've been really impressed with is, is watching the younger generation of foster kids really coalescing us together and saying, we're not going to allow this for yet another generation. 
Um, and, and it's inspiring to watch. And it's hopeful to me that that change is possible because when you're in it, when you're working in it, you can lose the forest for the trees. I sometimes think, are we making any dents at all? Um, I talked to other people who aged out or who are my age, who've aged out, were like, it feels like nothing's changed. You know, we hear young kids sharing their stories and they're just in a new time period, right? Like those are our same stories. So has anything changed? But then I see a kid doing a podcast. I see someone and I'm like, it has changed because that was, that wouldn't have been possible um, before and it is possible now. So you see those subtle changes that give you the energy to keep going. Definitely, definitely. Um, you dropped so many gems right there. Um, I think I think back and you know, I I think back to navigating um, transitioning out. Um, and when I aged out of the system, it felt to me because I I, I grew up with my brothers and sisters who were in the units with me, you know, because most of my time was spent in congregate care. Like I, like, yep. sometimes didn't see daylight, you know, like, it's just yeah. all to a real reality, you know, um, and a lot of them did not make it. And mm -hmm. um, when aging out, um, there was this anger, there was this bitterness, there was this like how could you kind of feel it because you know I, I I and I and I stumbled with that for a while you know on top of my institutionalization mm -hmm. and you can probably you know soak it all into the whole institutionalization but I struggled with that for a, a little while because um society and the stigmas around it you get it from people then you get it from television and you get it from books where you were the root cause, you were a problem or what have you. Um, so when you said that, you know, in, in your time, you know, um, people weren't really too vocal about it, you know, and people, when, when you start to, you know, disclose your experience and, you know, um, who you were and what have you, um, it was kind of similar in, in my own right. And it, it felt as though, you know, until I got to where I am now, just mm -hmm. being completely real with the audience, you know, and you, uh, when I disclosed, when I first aged out, everyone looked at me as um, an issue. Yeah. Or as someone can, to save or someone to save, which, right, which right. wasn't a good feeling either. Right. As I grew, you know, and develop, okay, you know, I didn't know how to tell my story in the best way. I'm a kid from Detroit, rough around the edges, got a few cussing yeah. words in between what I'm probably sharing my story with and stuff like that. As I grew and developed, and it looked a little bit more professional to where I am now, people are like, oh, yeah, you know, that's Michael, you know, and stuff like that. And there's still stickers more importantly probably placed on me um mm -hmm. still today but the more important fact of it is that um I've built um a kind of block a, a, a roadblock between you know stigma and fact you know mm -hmm. um and trying to help educate people because I'm one of a few that you know go through the system and end up on both sides I was on the doing outside first and then got to the foster care side, okay. you know, so at some point in my life, I had been labeled as a delinquent, but what I have to explain to people <laughs> and share my story is that I was supposed to be in foster care a long time ago. It wasn't okay. until um, my body and my mind left this world for a little bit uh, mentally um, because of the abuse that I endured, the mm -hmm. reactions that came out of that led me to the juvenile system you know um and we talk about trauma and how that induces so many different things but for me you know um it was a side effect of the root cause well I, and i'm not sure about a side effect i mean there's so many great things in there michael just listening to you that that 
resonate. And I, I think what's interesting is, is like people are like, what could a, a young black man and an old white lady have in common, mm -hmm. right? And it's outside. And what's really interesting about that is uh, the use of the word stigma first, right? Because ultimately mm -hmm. it's like, what's our bias around that? The stigma that comes to a young black man who has been a juvenile delinquent versus an old white lady who's been a juvenile delinquent, right? Yeah. It's very different. It's a, it's a really interesting thing. And I, I talk about my time in congregate care really differently because I was the only white girl in congregate care. Mm. And so it was really black women who saved me. It was black women, black girls at the time. Now they're women, right? Were, um, who showed me the path forward. But it, it's also when we talk about that equity, when we talk about that stigma, in the way that I understand my own privilege of that time. And I'll just give you an example. When we were on the units together, we didn't have easy access to feminine hygiene products. There was like a whole procedure you had to go through to get feminine hygiene products, right? Like you had to make a request. And when the black girls on my unit would make the request, they wouldn't get the products. Yeah. When I would make the you request, make a request. <laughs> you had to make a request right? So when I would make the request, we would get the products. Now, we didn't have the language of privilege and white privilege when we were 13 and 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. That just didn't exist. But we knew what was going on. We knew that there was a difference in treatment that, that, that was happening. We just learned how to sub-step it to get our needs met, to survive. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing, you learn these things to survive. So the behaviors that then you talk about that led to delinquency, right, are really, we look at a behavior and we think about trying to correct the behavior instead of, <clears throat> excuse me, understanding what the behavior is trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. In other words, what's underneath the behavior? So we hear with foster kids all the time, oh, they lie all the time, right? I hear this from foster parents, how do I help like, but lying is a way to keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. Fighting is a way to keep ourselves safe. Stealing is a way to keep ourselves safe. Well, how could that be? Because I need to eat. It keeps me safe. It keeps me here. And that when we begin to see what sometimes appear as negative actions from really an unmet need, we see the whole thing differently. Now people can say, well, listen, I can't just let kids keep stealing cars or I can't let kids, right? Just because they had a, a traumatic experience. Well, it's not either or, it's yes and. We can hold people responsible in trauma-informed ways. But to do that, you have to see it as an unmet need first. And if you see it that you're just gonna punish someone out of behavior and listen, as a kid on the unit, you're not. You won't punish a kid out of the behavior. I've watched people take severe action against kids trying to, uh, deadly action against kids trying to get them to change their behavior. You won't. What you have to do is see the unmet need. And what is critical for me, what breaks my heart is thinking about my own experience, thinking about your experience, thinking about the 500,000 kids who are having the experience today in America is what's the unmet need that we're being distracted from because of a behavior we don't like or that we don't think is a good behavior or it's a behavior we would like to see changed. And so we get distracted by the behavior instead of seeing the unmet need. And I think when I hear your story, I'm like, there was an unmet need for Michael. There was an unmet need for me. There was an unmet need for many of the women uh, that were on my unit. And like you said, of those women, I know we're only um, a handful of them are today. And out of the handful that I know where they are today, there's only two of us that are still alive. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, you know, and, that, and that's something that I speak about quite frequently on my podcast, you know, identifying, you know, or understanding that behavior is language, mm -hmm. you know, um, and not looking at behavior as like a, a consequence in a way, you know, but really, you know, 
trying to dive deeper, you know, I, and I'm not a yeah. psychologist, you know, I'm not a, a trade social worker or anything <laughs> like that, you know, um, but I've been around the block. Of, but you're an expert. Time. But you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And um, working in the front lines, you know, doing peer support, mentoring, you know, um, working in these juveniles and these facilities and, you know, doing all these different um, things across the country. I, I'm able to see things from a different lens, see them from the 20 different residentials and congregate care and juvenile facilities that I've been in, you know, mm -hmm. then also see them from the five or so different juveniles and um, facilities of congregate care that I worked in, then see them from the expert, you know, who've been talking about these things, doing research, you know, educating myself even more. So I, you know, having three different perspectives, you know, and understanding that um no and, and I you grow up, you know, and you you can't help but to soak up some of these different things that society has. But really understanding the concept, because I had a worker that used to always say this, there's no such thing as a bad kid really understanding that there's no such thing as a bad kid or a bad person. You know, when we really get to the roots of, you know, why people do what they do, you know, there always is an answer, you mm -hmm. know, that we can come back to. And granted, you know, we may not understand all why people do what they do, because in society, we have seen some really awful things. But I promise you, you know, when we dive deep, um, into such things. And for an example, you know, I've been really trying to understand um, the Black and minority culture as far as abuse and neglect cases, you know, and how does the fine line between discipline and um, just appropriate parenting, you know, um, what did that derive from? And I've been doing a lot of investigating mm -hmm. research into like, you know, culture and history. And there's a lot of books and, you know, people that are talking about how, um, how slavery and the beatings between slavery impacted how we discipline our kids and society and go overboard to where it's abuse, abuse and it's neglect, you know? Um, and I, I asked myself because we're, and I'm not in no way comparison, so nobody get mad at me. How does this look in other cultural groups? You mm -hmm. know, um, how does the history impact how they treat their kids? You That's know, right. um, and what does that look like for the society if we all have endured trauma um, in our history? How does that impact the generations? And what does those little droplets do over time? And we're seeing it, you know, <laughs> we're seeing what it does over time, you know, um, and I know that's a lot, you know, everybody doesn't have the time to be like, well, you know, this is why this is that, you know, but reality is when we make the time, you know, mm -hmm. maybe we can do a little bit more better. Curious yeah, what your are. yeah I, I, so many good pieces there. So I was thinking at the beginning there, right? So attention seeking is attachment seeking, which is, I, I do these behaviors and if if good behavior isn't getting me what whatever good behavior is, right? But if that's not getting me what I'm seeking, I will escalate my behavior until it gets me what I'm seeking. And so if I'm a small child and I'm going to school and doing the things that I'm supposed to, but I'm still not getting the attention that I seek at home, I will begin escalating my behavior until I will get attention, even if it's in a negative way, right? Which I think both of us would look back on our lives and say, yep, okay, check, yep. yes, check. Um, and then as, as I was listening to you talk about how we're just processing history and culture and our own stories and how we came to this, I, I, I sort of agree with you on where you're arriving with the slavery, but I would take it even a step further into modern, right? Take, taking that piece a step further that uh, how do we keep our black sons safe? I've, I've listened to, mm. to black women in my life say this is like, I feel like I have to be hard on my sons specifically because I have to prepare them for what the world is, is going to give them. Mm -hmm. that, that viewpoint, that stance doesn't come from nowhere. That's yeah. real. And, and so what, what impact does that have? Now from a white culture, right? 
uh, mine's a little bit different because I grew up really differently than maybe a lot of other white people. I grew up in a lot of black communities with a lot of black influence, even though I am not black, I don't identify as black. And so um, I saw something really quite different, which was I saw black families as a thing to aspire to because I saw aunties and grandmas coming together to raise generations of kids that I didn't see in white culture where white families seemed very isolated from one another. They didn't have the togetherness that I saw in black culture and black families. Um, and, and the many people that came together to raise children oftentimes. I felt very isolated in that way because it for me seemed like I only had this white mother who was at the who suffered from mental illness, who had drug addiction, um, and and who really by themselves couldn't do that, right? We didn't, mm -hmm. there was no village, so to speak, that was coming around that. But what interestingly happened was is that those black aunts, those black grandmothers came around me regardless. And and as I think about Black history in America, it's very much what was happening in slavery, is that it was the Black women raising white children. It was the Black women coming to rescue those babies um, in all the stories that we hear. Now, what is the droplets of that going forward in white culture is, I think you see an increase, not of the physical abuse that you're talking about that we mm -hmm. see and what's the line of discipline in black families, but in emotional abuse and neglect yeah. um, in that way in white families and the droplets of not owning emotions, not talking about it, not being able to speak the truth. I think we see that in white culture is that even the, the pushback about talking about slavery, about talking about Black Lives Matter, that the pushback is, is we don't talk about these things in white culture. If it's hard, we don't talk about it and you see those droplets that carry forward, even in my own self when I say I didn't share my own story, because it's the droplets of, we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't talk about physical abuse, sexual abuse. These are, these are mute points that should never be spoken of. And so I think you do see it culturally. Can I speak to other cultures? No, of course not. I can only speak to what I'm seeing in white culture in my experience, but in my experience, I, I resonate deeply with what you're saying is that these pieces of trauma are carrying forward and that we do have to call them out into space if we're really going to heal as a society, as a real community, as if we're really going to come together as all humans um, to solve this problem, that we have no choice but to call it out and start owning our piece of it. Definitely. Um... I think back, you know, um, to being younger, um, there wasn't always bad times, you know, and That's a, lot right. people, a lot of people think like, oh, well, you went through this and this, you know, it just must have been awful. Like, granted, there was those, you wake up one day and you knew it was going to be a good day, you know, yeah. before, yeah. You know, before I ended up in a system like, you know, and I, yeah. and I, talk, I talk about, you know, my mom and my dad were married at some point. Um, there were some really awful days and then mm -hmm. there was those once in a blue moon good days that's right um and even after you know my dad left and um a lot of the projection of him leaving and and feelings were projected onto me which stirred the abuse from my mom mm -hmm. um there were still some okay days and i think um think back to the atmosphere of being in urban Detroit. Mm -hmm. And um, this is before a lot of the, you know, gentrification has started happening in Detroit where we're seeing like downtown been uplifted, things didn't get us. This is where you still saw trash on the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Wild um, animals. Yeah. 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 Um, 
So one of the biggest things, you know, I was talking with um, MDHS, uh, HS, um, and I've been doing a lot of work as far as their reforms and their initiatives with them. And I was explaining to them that throughout these small bursts of happy moments, there's something that I saw that really just stayed with me throughout the depths of time in my experience. And it was the aspect that when something went wrong, the community came together. They put a, a box of goods together. You know, the, the older ladies, you know, who more likely saw themselves and some of the younger ladies that were single parenting um, would watch the kids, you know, and mm-hmm. let the parent. You know, it was those little things that I saw that I'm like, if we approach things with families and preservation and prevention, um, if we approach things as a government agency trying to work with the community from this village standpoint, you know, that it's it's a collective, you know, we're yeah. trying to be inclusive, you know, we're trying to keep the aspect of community instead of the, the line of separation, what would that look like, you mm-hmm. know, um, and is that the next level of trauma-informed care in the community? Um, far as being um, informed with parents that may have hardships, you mm-hmm. know, because we understand inflation doesn't just hit one one side, it's hitting everybody, yeah. you know, um, and stuff like that. We understand that, you know, per our, our numbers and um, economic standing with people and equity that uh, it takes multiple jobs, you know, and when it taking multiple jobs, that means that a lot of people aren't able to go to college you know, or finish mm-hmm. college. That means that unfortunately, you know, people who have kids, you know, have to spend more time away from their kids to be able to make sure that there's a house, you know. Um, so are we considering that neglect? Are we considering that abuse? If, you know, people who are trying to make it, but unfortunately they don't have that family, you know, net, that village, you know, to support them. They can't afford childcare because that's an extra 300 you know, so well, it's more than three hundred. I don't know where you are, but like that's an expensive <laughs> thing, right? Like, so the the interesting thing here for me is is when are we going to start asking what the people need mm-hmm. instead of dictating what they need, and when will we address our bias around poverty? Because mm. I think those are two really big questions to consider. As 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 you said, what's the What's the next phase? What is this going to evolve into? And if we're really about family preservation, which I hear both sides of the aisle talk about quite a bit, but I'm not mm-hmm. sure I, I believe either, right? So <laughs> at, there's there's words and there's action. Yes. And so for me, if we truly believe in family preservation, we know how much it costs us as a society to remove a child. Mm. regardless of the, the you know why we remove a child there's a cost there's the immediate cost of attorneys and court cost and judges and if we're sending the kid to congregate care or a foster home the cost of all of that and then there's the long-term cost of therapy mental health all of these things if they get involved with the juvenile justice system which we know about 80 percent of youth removed will then it's the long-term cost of housing them in jail or prison, right? The, so there's all these social costs of foster care as well. And so many people have done the report. We know it's a negative number. For every dollar we spend in child welfare, we lose roughly $9. So uh, on a money concept, people should be invested for that reason. If, if you pay taxes, you should care about the issue because you're getting a negative return on investment that's not good, right? We're all looking for positive returns. Mm -hmm. On the just heart of the matter is, is if that's all true, if we accept that as the truth, that's what all the statistics tell us, then keeping kids and families makes more sense. Mm -hmm. So now we have to address poverty. So doesn't it make more sense for me to pay someone's electric bill than to remove their child? Does Mm -hmm. it make more sense for me to, uh, empower a community to come around a family because even if i pay an an electric bill that's not long term that's short term Mm -hmm. 
So how do I empower, what does a community need to come around a family struggling within their own community? And how do we empower the community to just take care of that family? And how do we get back to that? Because I think a lot of the ways in which I grew up, you know, obviously in a much different time, Michael, than you is the community still came around. Mm -hmm. The community still helped out. To your point, there were still food left on our porch when they knew I wasn't eating. I still got invited to the neighbors to have dinner. Hey, why don't you come have dinner with us knowing that there was no dinner in my house? Mm -hmm. Like that was the community responding to the need and it was working. When it stopped working was when I was removed from that community I had developed. And now I was left on my own to do it. And what we know is that no state, no government can substitute a family. No. That's not its job. That's not its intended purpose. Mm -hmm. And so then what? Because because when do you age out of family? 18, 21, everyone talked about raising the age. You're 25. Do you not need family anymore? I'm 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 creeping to 50. Do I not need family anymore? That's untrue. You need it your whole life. And so if we're going to continue to remove children, not just from their blood family, from their biological family, but their community is their family as well. Mm -hmm. Instead of coming around families, instead of coming around community saying, what is it you need? Does this community need a childcare facility? What do you need? To me, that's health and human services. That's what health and human services is. That's the definition of health and human services is that this community might be lacking a child care facility. This community might be lacking something else. That's where we come in. That's our duty is to run a child care facility so that that's accessible to everybody. That burden removes something. Or, or we run a food pantry here. We run meals here. That's health and human services to me. Health and human services isn't severing the ties to everything and everyone you know. And then somehow thinking a miracle will happen and you will succeed. Definitely. And then pointing and then pointing to people like you, Michael, and people like me, who by very chance and often a lot of luck succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, we've also had a lot of hard work, but we've had some luck on our side. We succeed and then saying, see, it works. No, no, I'm still struggling. I would guess yeah. that you still struggle with some of your own stuff. I'm mm -hmm. still struggling. And and I'm not a success. I just did it in spite of you. Because that's if it were success, the system wants us to fail. Because it wants us to move from the foster care system to the criminal justice system. That's what it was designed to do, was to house us. And, and, and we spited them we spited them and now they want to point to us as a success when really that's not fair and true because they're successful in all the people that they move from one pipeline to the next pipeline um and, and that isn't its intended purpose that is not health and human service in my mind that's not what its intended purpose is supposed to be Definitely. there's my soapbox <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You 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 drop so many gems in there, and you know one of the biggest things that you know stood out to me is just this aspect of linear success. You know, and I, I'm really, I'm really just mm, you know stepping away. Like I, I know it is a word, but kind of just stepping away from that mm -hmm. word because it, it starts to you know give off toxic positivity vibes. That's right. You know, um, because everyone thrives in their own right you know they and just you know to be transparent with you guys listening um i i i've experienced being evicted in like 2018 and from 2018 to 2020 um my life has been on like i've been doing a lot of advocacy all these great things and stuff like that but as far as finding a stable foundation i do not have that you know, I work as a transitional house manager amongst nine other jobs to sustain myself while going to school and still trying to do this advocacy because I believe this is what God has called upon my life. Um, and granted, 
I have no worries because of my faith and what I trust that mm-hmm. will be taken care of. But granted, if something were to happen with this nonprofit that I'm working under and living with, um, I don't have nothing else. You know, um, my yep. family relationship is still still rocky, you know, um, and it's almost, you know, I, I could go stay with them, but the enduring abuse, why well, stay with them? You know, um, just as, as an adult, like that's the reality. Yes. You know, homelessness, yes. living in my car or going to stay with somebody and enduring ridicule and abuse, you know, from things in my past to things in, in my life now to, to you know, um, and what have you. So when we talk about, you know, um, the needs for family, you know, support mm-hmm. and stuff like that, um, that's not linear either. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's really not like this one, well, you're 18, you got it. You know, you you 25, you got it. Scientifically, it's not even that, you know, because we That's know right. the trauma behind the brain and, you know, some people being stagnant at certain ages because of their trauma. So why are we thinking that when they get 18, that they're going to be out of impulse brain. When they get 25, that they're going to be out of impulse brain and what have you. When trauma has stunted them so severely that they may always be in impulse brain. They may be able to reach a certain point of maturity to function as an adult, but impulse brain may be stuck there because they have spent their life within a system that has corrupted them and filled them with trauma. You know, and, and and I think I just you know, have to nod. I just have to nod, Michael, because yeah. you're so. I mean, you're just <laughs> absolutely so right. I mean, there, there's nothing Definitely. I can add except for yes, amen. You're exactly correct. Who do we go tell? Like, I just want to take that piece <laughs> of your segment and be like this, this, because it's mm-hmm. it's everybody. It's it's. Listen, I've written a book. I run a business, like I have clients, I do things, and I am this far away at any given time to not having to any lose, of it. And there is to lose it all. The, and there is no uh, safety net. That's the thing. There mm-hmm. is no safety net. I'm not going to move in with my parents. I'm not going to. That doesn't exist for me. That will never right. exist for me. I mean, I have a 20 year old daughter who's never met her grandmother. Mm. right like people don't want to talk about the long-term impacts so all those Mm. grandparents days at school yeah like I had to explain to like my kindergartner why she doesn't have a grandparent coming Mm -hmm. like other people are like it's not just my impact it's the impact also of everyone attached to Mm. me right that relies on me as well and I hear it with you it's like yeah I got this thing going yeah, I'm doing these things. It's really easy to say, look at Michael's working on his doctorate degree. He's amazing. Look at everything he's accomplished. And one little thing can happen and it's all gone in a flash. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's something you don't control. You have no say over that nonprofit. What happens if they get mm-hmm. funding, if they don't? And that's what I think people don't understand about the long-term impacts of not just foster care, but of poverty in general that we don't want to have a reckoning with is yeah. that we're responsible that that somehow we've deemed it okay for people to fly to space and spend billions of dollars flying to space while people on this earth can't feed themselves and don't have a safety net and that that inequity to me is as unjustifiable yeah i look at you know some of the things that other nations are doing and they're doing really great strides in the aspect of family preservation prevention or keeping mm-hmm. people in the family but also an aspect of you lose your job you come back from the war you know you not ended up on the street that's right you know the services help you have your own places you know you know help you get back on your feet and it isn't just go wait in this line <laughs> And Michigan works, <laughs> you know, or unemployment, you know, or what have you. It's, we're going to put you into an apartment, you know, um, we're going to help you, you know, get back on your feet. Do you, and also, because this experience has been traumatizing, let's get you some mental health support. Now, granted, these are some very 
you know, developed countries that, you know, have funding and some, but something that they're doing, you know, is- But it, this it, country has funding. This country has funding. And, and we know it has funding because somehow we had funding during COVID. Yeah, it just came out of nowhere. Right, I, so that funding you know. exists. It's how <laughs> we're choosing to suspend it. But I, I'll even push you further because I know of countries that if you don't have a job, like if you can't get work, then mm -hmm. there's a job in the state for you. So all state jobs, all government jobs are for those who can't get placed in other positions. Mm. Now think about that for a second, because like wow. for most of us, we'd be like, oh, if you have a state or federal job, like that's a lot of security, right? If you have uh -huh. a government job, that's a good job. That's how we would think about it in America. That's a good steady job. In other countries, they view those as like, these are the jobs for those that we can't place in other positions. So if we can't help you in the get into the private industry, then you get a state job so that you're still employed that so you can still work so wow. you can have that place so you do have right think about that but you know listen i age out of care at 18 i'm knocking on the door of 50 i've never had health care mm. wow. i live in a country where i've never had health care my whole life Wow. Like just for a minute versus just a minimum. Why don't we just have a minimum? Mm. Why, and why don't we want people to have a minimum? The only reason I have health care is because of the 26th sector. <laughs> because I could not afford to pay. That's right. <laughs> That's the only reason. And I, I find that to be the reality of most people I know who age out of the system. Who can afford to pay a per diem? Who, who's going right. to go to get mental health services? That's right. There's some pills out here that's $90 a pill. Yeah, no. So when you say that to me, it it, it, stri it, strikes, it strikes a nerve with me because I'm like, on one end, we're telling people to get help. That's right. But if this but we want to put it on them like it's it's their sole responsibility yeah. you know we have a responsibility as a as a society to make it available mm. it's one thing to tell people to get help you know my daughter's living in london england right now she's going to college in london like to be a student there even as an american right she mm. had to pay a fee but the fee by the way michael was 580 dollars, and she has health care for all four years that she's there yeah. <laughs> for $580 for four years, she has access to, to at least minimum health care. And now when I say health care, by the way, she goes to a therapist. She pays no copay. She gets medication. She sees and talks to her physician on a regular basis. For check-ins, they do telehealth, but she has check-ins on a regular basis. Is it perfect? Is the system perfect? No, but she has a minimum. If she wanted better, she could buy better. But guess what? If you say, okay, you need to go see someone, guess what? She can go see someone. That's a real piece of advice. If they, if she goes in and you should go see your doctor about this, she can go see a doctor about that. Here, if I say to you, Michael, you should go see someone about that you, your first thought is how will I afford that man that's in my whole life got to pull out a chart and talk about budgeting like and, and, yeah. and weigh uh, pros versus cons can I live with this or do I need to just chop my leg off you right. know and, and let's and let's be honest that that if I'm having a mental health condition am I in a space to then have to think all that through mm. Or if my if I've cut my leg off or partially off, or I have a rash or a cold, and I don't know if it's COVID or the flu, or it'll just go away with some NyQuil or Robitussin that I can buy at CVS, versus do I really need to go in and, and have this looked at? Like mm -hmm. I can that's like a, you know, we have this conversation in my household all the time. Like, okay, should I get a yearly exam this year or could I wait a second year? Can I do it every other year for a checkup? 
because we're getting older. So like, should we, mm -hmm. is it important to do it this year? Or could I do it every other? Because the $1,200, should I pay my car down or should I go in for a yearly exam? And should these should be things that you got to either or with. And I feel like that has, like, and, feel, and, and, you know, granted, I know there's some very successful people out here who came from this, you know, child welfare experience and what have you. But granted, I, I feel like we, that, strict, that sticks with me now. Like, I feel like even as a 25-year-old, I'm working that much harder since I've aged out with virtually you know you have your associates you have your people who are friends in the moment but you really don't know if they're friends that's going to be there and thick and thin you know yes. and um when you go through different things and, and stuff like that and you are trying to make it it's always that you don't have the coffee pot problem where you your coffee pot, pot breaks and you can just go to walmart and go buy another one you have problems where you need to, you can only put $5 in your gas tank because if you go anything other than that, you're not going to be able to afford rent. You know, <laughs> like, and these are real realities. And I was speaking with some people in California where California costs ex way too yes. much. So people are aging out. Like when we talk about aging out into homeless, people are aging out into homelessness because they can't afford to live in a state that they aged out in. That's right. You know, and, and, and this is like a crisis predicament, whichever you want to call it, because everything is a crisis. The, the world is at crisis right now, to be, to be completely, <laughs> you know, we talk about all these different aspects, you know, from, you know, mental health to community to uh, health, you know, in general, mm -hmm. you know, but there's so many different things pots boiling over on the stove you know? well and and i'm gonna bring us right back i i just love your example there in the book i talked about when i aged out that um i was living in this apartment but i didn't have any pots or pans and so i went to meyer right so we're all michiganders so we know meyer mm -hmm. and i go i show up at meyer and the cheapest pan i can find is six dollars and my thought is I'm going to get the saucepan because I could brown meat in it. I could boil water in it. Like it can do a, a lot of things with this one pan. And the pan was $6. I had to put that pan on layaway. No, this will date me. I had to put a $6 pan on layaway and make a weekly payment because I didn't have $6. Like we have to understand poverty to understand changes because so many people don't understand it. Now, I was also like 18. So I didn't think about going to a garage sale. Like there are skills and things mm -hmm. that you just lack because like, I need this pan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Michael, I, I was 18. I told you I'm almost 50 now. I just sold that pan at a garage sale, that $6 pan, because, not because it was a great pan, Michael, but like, it was like letting a piece of that go, right? Let, letting the, uh, that history go. But I was so connected to that damn pan that I just couldn't let it go. But we have to understand poverty in those depths to understand what we really need in communities. Because when people say, just stop watching Netflix, just don't, don't drink a cup of coffee. Um, I couldn't eat until I had the pan. So guess what I had to do? I had to go to Taco Bell and buy 69 cent bean burritos until the time I could get a pan to cook for myself. Like people don't understand that. They just see mm -hmm. people making decisions. Again, they see the behavior. They don't understand what's underneath that headline. Mm -hmm. To me, the behavior is a headline and if you knew the story beneath the headline, you would probably cry. And yeah. that's that's really how I see it. And so to your point, these pots that are boiling over, the needs are so overwhelming. We're choosing to ignore it. We're mm -hmm. choosing to believe that people want to live in poverty. We convince ourselves of that because we don't want to admit that they need help, that they need assistance, that they need a helping hand. 
it's it's easier to say it's their fault. They're making choices. If they made better choices, they wouldn't be in this situation. I want to know how you look at me and say, Shen, you should have not bought that six dollar pan. <laughs> right? And there's some people out you should have made a better that. choice. <laughs> You should have made a better choice. Out there, that were you really should have gone to a garage sale and got one for twenty five cents. You should have made a better choice. Or that girl that was me that was sitting at MSU's campus needing a job, and the two jobs were to become a stripper or to make minimum wage. When stripping pays quadruple the amount that minimum wage pays. Mm -hmm. So you can't tell me it's about choice. That's not a choice. Those are people surviving. That's me surviving yeah. and that's other people surviving. And it's not fair to just say people make bad choices and they have to live in their bad choices. That's untrue. We have greedy people who make money on poverty. Poverty is profitable for some. Mm -hmm. There are groups and businesses and systems that make money off the backs of those stuck in the cycle of poverty. And that, in my opinion, is what we really need to be in addressing. Truly, truly couldn't have said it better myself. Um, wow. We've touched on so many deep, you know, needed conversations. And that is what this platform is for. You know, I um, I, rem I, I, I have to acknowledge this. Like I said a prayer before. I say a prayer before I do every episode, you know, and I, you know, um, just ask that, you know, that this episode be purposeful, that it be meaningful, that it touch somebody, you know, that someone gets something out of this, you know, and I really hope that, you know, you guys that are listening are really, really you know, able to take heed in this, you know, um, and, and even if it's really just a realization for self, you know, just understanding where you're at, you know, where you can be and what have you. Um, Whatever it is, you know, I just hope that you're able to reflect. And I always say this, but, you know, my chance you're listening to this, you know, and you're better off, you know, for whatever reason. Don't let this conversation fall on deaf ears, you know. Um, take this conversation on, you know, to the next person, you know, to the family conversation, mm -hmm. you know, you know, to the dinner table, you know, and have conversation I be truly believe as a community the more we talk about these different topics and what's happening in the world we don't know what that's going to strike you know or uh, strike the next person who's going to be president years later or you know that you know whatever's going on we don't know what may come out of it but we know we all you know by having these conversations we all become better educated you know um so that being said, you know, um, we've touched on so many different things, and I only have a couple more questions for you. Um, and the first one being, what advice would you like to leave here? Um, that's such a, such a tough question. And so my first response is, what, I, what would I say to, to 18 year old me? Is kind of what I think when I hear that. And besides the fact that I would tell 18-year-old me to buy Amazon stock, that's that's my first piece of advice to 18-year-old me. My second piece of advice is uh, almost something I heard you say earlier, which is tune out the others and do you. Don't don't believe it. Don't believe it when you're successful and don't believe it when you're struggling. And and just keep marching, keep doing what fills your heart. And uh, everyone else will figure it out. But 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 you heal you and you do what your heart is telling you you should do. Definitely, definitely. Um, any last comments? And this really is for a place for you to, you know, share some shameless plugs, how people can follow you. I know you're an author, you know, you're doing great work in this um arena of child welfare, you know, um, so how can people stay connected with you, see what you're doing, you know, follow you or support you? Uh, appreciate that, Michael. So the book Garbage Bag Suitcase is available in all formats. Uh, you can find it on my website, garbagebagsuitcase.com or shuffaloconsulting.com. 
You can follow on social media. There's tons of free resources on the shuffleofconsulting.com website. If you're interested in your own personal development or for systems or organizations that you work in, and you can always email or reach out. And you can support Resilient Voices and Beyond. I'm sure they could use a financial donation as well. Supporting other foster kids is supporting me as well. Definitely, definitely. I appreciate that, uh, especially that that shameless plug there. Um, one thing I do want to hit before I do my outro is one of the significant things we touched on so many things and I hope they all strike strike you and uh, sticks with you and help you reflect on some things and yeah you know, I, I don't know what going to come out of it but I just hope it follows with you you know um one thing that we touched on is in this arena you know me you know uh we're, we're, well let me take a step back we're looked at, you know, as successful cases, <laughs> looked at as people who made it, you know, um, and for those agencies that may be listening to this or what have you, I, I really hope that if anything you take from that part of the conversation is that to be more inclusive, do not just pick the person who's doing good and their model case because Granted, they can add some things. Do let those people speak on panels, but also get a diverse group of people who are in different stages of that aspect of thriving. Because that's yeah. that's what's going to help you re reveal the flaws and what needs to change. You know, um, granted, I I was one of those people that was a model case, but I still said what I needed to say. But everybody isn't a Michael, you know? <laughs> you know, so please, you know, diversify, you know, and don't be afraid to hear what's going wrong. You know, I, I think we all can grow from that. I think we all can, you know, um, get out of this mindset of, well, this person is successful, that person is successful, this person is this, that person is that. We all thrive in our own unique way. And um, I'm a firm believer, it. I would love to be living comfortably, you know, um, but I also, by my faith, you know, I'm not meant to be comfortable in this world. <laughs> you know? I'm living to live again, you know, and some people listening may understand that, you know, if you don't, you don't. <laughs> but I, um, I also, you know, reminisce with something that you said, you know, about being selfish, you know, by not sharing my story. That's something I had to come to realization too, is that I'm not here for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I firmly believe that, you know, no one on this earth is here for themselves. Everyone are, everyone is connected in some way and shape, you know, That's when right. we decide to step into our purpose, we don't know who we are able to help or who we are supposed to help, you know, but I do believe a lot of people are falling short of what they are supposed to be doing in this world and going with what they feel they need to do instead of what is needed of them. Um, Michael, but, can I add just one thing to your request for the agencies, which is not only reach out to the that diverse population, not just the ones that you see successful, but also pay them for their expertise. Can I yeah. just add that? They deserve to be paid for their expertise. If you want mm -hmm. information from people, uh, because they have information you don't, they have insight that you don't, they deserve to be paid for that expertise and that insight. Definitely, definitely. And with that being said, you know, <laughs> uh, this has been Resilient Voices and Beyond, episode 23. Um, some things we've mentioned in here may, you know, strike a nerve. You know, some things can be potentially triggering to some people, you know. Um, if that has happened, please take some time to center yourself before going into anything else, you know, that you have planned for your day or night, you know, um, do some mindfulness exercises, you know, some self-care, you know, um, but also if something has triggered you throughout anything that we have said, and it has brought up some memories or some, you know, different things that have happened in your 
um, past from your lived experience, don't sit in it. You know, um, my contact information is somewhere tied to my podcast. I'm willing to help you find resources or navigate, you know, pursuing that if that's something that you want to do as far as getting help, you know, or support, you know, um, even if it's not me, you know, cat, goldfish, associate, friend, you know, whatever, you know, talk to someone about that, you know, um, and just know that you're not alone. Um, outside of that, and it's cold and flu season, and COVID is still going rampant. Please, please, you know, uh, we all are part of this big thing called America that is this huge village. By you taking care of yourself helps the next person stay healthy, you know, so wear that mask if need be. Carry the little pocket-sized hand sanitizer. Make sure that you wash your hands also. Disinfect, you know, and different things like that. And I do know, you know, if you aren't able to afford masks, you know, hand sanitizer, stuff like that, there's still resources within the community, you know, that you're able to get these things for free, you know. So if you are somehow listening to this and you're homeless and you're trying to stay healthy, you know, there's resources to get masks, to get hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray. If, if you don't have that in your community, please reach out to me. You know, um, I'm, I'm trying to build resilient voices and beyond. Um, I don't have the backing um, or sponsorship yet, but I'm hoping I will. But if some reason you, you're out there on the streets and for whatever reason you're trying to make it, you need something, please contact me. I would do it what's all in my best, you know, my best power to help you, you know, get gloves, you know, get a coat, you know, get some hand sanitizer, get some disinfectant spray, you know, whatever you need, you know, um, because nobody deserves to be there. I was there at some point, you know, living out on the street, you know, and I want to do my part, you know, to help those individuals, especially it's getting cold out, you know, and this should be a shouldn't be a topic that's just brought up because it's getting cold out, but it's getting cold out. And a lot of people are going to try to stay in abandoned houses or stay in warming centers, you know, and sometimes those warming centers aren't safe. They aren't safe, you know, um, and what have you. So as you're thinking about what's going on in this season or how to give back or what have you, um, think about some of the small organizations that does some of this help and does some of these resources, you know, um, think about if you, Enjoy foster care, you know. No, no, no push towards, you know, or no, no bad ill will or what have you towards any of these great big agencies, you know. But think about donating to a, a small lived experience business. You know, there's a lot of foster youth who have businesses out here. There's a lot of adoptees that have businesses out there. There's a lot of people who've experienced the criminal justice system and are trying to start on that second chance of their life. You know, um, there's a lot of small black, um, indigenous, you know, you know, um, white, you know, uh, immigrant, you know, businesses that these people need our help more. You know, they're, they're entrepreneurs in their own right, and they're doing something small, which I find, and this is my bias appearing, I find the smaller the business, the more engaged you are with your clients, you know, and unfortunately, that's our society today. But, you know, I think, you know, those places could use your support during this given holiday, um, these given season and given holidays and what have you. So uh, if you do listen to this and if I can stir you anywhere, you know, um, but I want to thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for your support. This has been Resilient Voices and Beyond, season two, episode 23, I believe. <laughs> you know, I hope you guys have a good night, good morning, good whenever you're listening to this. Thank you. Talk to you guys soon.